Live from Gotham City, it's the Bat Podcast. I'm Pat the Batman fan, and welcome back for another exciting episode of the show. We got a lot of fun stuff for you today. Before we start, I want to take just a minute and bid a fond farewell to Lorenzo Semple Jr., who passed away recently. Lorenzo was primarily responsible for establishing the tone of the 1966 Batman TV series and film with Adam West, which was my and a lot of other people's first introduction to the Caped Crusader. He was a tremendously gifted writer, and he, he also scripted the classic thrillers The Parallax View and Three Days of the Condor, as well as the final James Bond film to star Sean Connery, Never Say Never Again, and of course the 1980 film version of Flash Gordon. He left an indelible mark on the legacy of Batman. He will be missed, and tonight, another bright star burns in the night sky over Gotham City. Okay, on with the show. Uh, My interview with Adrian Barbeau will be up in about a week or so, but before that I wanted to give you guys a little treat because I was lucky enough to interview somebody I've been dying to meet and to talk to for a long time now. Before he was Abe Sapien in the Hellboy films, before he was the Pale Man in Pan's Labyrinth, my guest today was the Thin Clown in Tim Burton's Batman Returns, part of the Penguin's Evil Red Triangle Circus Gang, and as I suspected, no one has interviewed him before specifically about his experiences on Batman Returns. So this is kind of an exclusive, and you're going to hear a lot of cool, never-before-heard stories and personal tidbits from one of Hollywood's most unique and talented individuals, Mr. Doug Jones. Before I interviewed him, everybody told me what a nice guy he was, and... Never have truer words been spoken. I interviewed him at the Monster Palooza convention in Burbank before the convention started, and when we couldn't find a suitable spot to, for our conversation, Doug said, you know what, let's just sit right here on the floor. <laughs> and so we did our interview right there, cross-legged on the floor at Monster Palooza. It was a wonderful conversation and an experience for me, and I hope for you as well. Although we did the interview before the doors had opened, there were still quite a few folks milling around. So there is some background noise, which is kind of par for the course with the convention interviews. But I don't believe it will detract from your enjoyment of our little chat. So without further ado... Release the bats. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. I know you're you. a busy guy. Thank no, you for well, taking uh, time out of your schedule. It's my room. absolute pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to talk to you first about mime. But here's, here's the thing. No, you don't talk about mime. You just, you just, it's got quiet art, isn't it? That's true. There's no talking. No. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get interested in that? In college, I was a, it was, I, I was um, a freshman at Ball State University in Indiana, mm-hmm. and um, I didn't really know what the art form was mm-hmm. until uh, a senior named Reed K. Steele, who lived in my dorm, had been watching me in the lunchroom the way I talked and expressed and flapped my hands mm-hmm. around and was tall and lanky. Mm-hmm. And he came up to me one day and said, have you ever heard of the art of mime? And I said, oh, uh, is that like pantomime? I, I think so. Mm-hmm. No talking, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he was the he was the student leader of a mime troupe on campus called Mime Over Matter. Oh my lord! See that? No, that's funny. <laughs> that's a pun, you know. That's what we call. It. So, uh, so he said, "Come see one of our shows, and then we'll talk." And that's so I did. I went and saw the show that weekend, uh, uh, and I was mesmerized by this stage full of people wearing you know black leotard things and with, a, with nothing but a black curtain behind them and white face, white gloves, and they were making worlds happen that I, that I could imagine. Props that weren't there, and other people that weren't there, and animals that weren't there, and cars that weren't there. And uh, they were walking in, against the wind, and they were building walls that weren't there. And it was just such a fascinating art form that I, I did immediately, like, uh, yes, I want to, how do I audition for this troupe? Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So I did, and they took me, and, and uh, that started my four years in the mime troupe at Ball State University. So with that, I developed my own solo act, and and uh, with doing that, and with coming up with sketches and material to do our, our next show and our next show, uh, I guess my body responded to storytelling. It, you take verbal dialogue away, and then you're left with visual dialogue, right? So 
Uh, that's why the facial expression, your posturing, your gestures, and then all that body isolation type technique that you do to create things that aren't there, like leaning against a wall or walking against the wind or whatever, that's all skill that you have to learn and uh, practice. And uh, I had no idea that that was early groundwork for wearing creature monster suits and makeups later in my career that, that wear um, expression and in, sometimes with dialogue, sometimes without, mm -hmm. but still a story being told with every character that you play like this. So uh, uh, I had no idea of the groundwork that, that was being laid, but I'm really thankful for it. I was going to ask if your acting career stemmed from the mind work. They were side by side all the way. I, when I was a, when I was a, a kid, I was I was a, I was a lanky. Uh, yeah, look at me now. I'm six three and a half, 140 pounds. I've always looked like this. I was the tallest in my class. I was the skinniest in my class. I was the least athletic in my class. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're built like that in Indiana, kids make fun of you relentlessly. Defense mechanism is I will have a sense of humor. Right. I will. If they're going to laugh at me, I'm going to be in control of why they're laughing at me. Right. Exactly. Right. So that developed a, a, with inspiration from Dick Van Dyke and um, Don Knotts and. Uh, Bob Denver as Gilligan, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Jim Neighbors as Gomer mm -hmm. from G Gomer Pyle. Those were guys that gave skinny, goofy character people breath and life, and and they got the laughs. They were in control of, of when the laughs came. So I really admired them and, and learned from them. Moving on to the reason, the yes, <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> yeah. our little chat here today. Uh, Batman Returns was, as you said, your first uh, big St studio, studio movie. Film. Yeah, yeah. Now, that must have been overwhelming to jump into that frying pan. Beyond exciting, yeah. Um, well, and how that came about yes. for me, uh, because I was not an, uh, I was not in the ilk of actor that would have been seen for that project at the time. Uh, I'd done the Mac Tonight commercials for McDonald's, right. the Crescent Moonhead, mm -hmm. with some great popularity, uh, and they had like a three-year run. I did like 27 commercials in that time, and uh, and then they came to a close. And when the, that commercial campaign went off the air, I did a horror film called Night Angel. Mm -hmm. It was fine. There was love, mm -hmm. but you know it didn't pay as much as I'd hoped. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, well, I got to get a job. So. An opportunity came up to be uh, a background pirate in Hook, nice. Steven Spielberg's Hook. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I haven't done extra work in a long time at this point. I started doing extra work way back in the day, but I hadn't done it in a long time. But I was thinking, that there's bills to be paid. I have the summer off, and it's going to be shooting for three months during the summer of 1991. <sighs> I bit the bullet, bit my pride, mm -hmm. and I submitted myself for it. They loved me. Uh, I became an, an eye patch salesman, vendor, pirate in Pirate Town. And thank heaven, one day at, on the set, stuntman Bob Yurkis was helping the stunt department. He's a, a legendary stuntman. He, uh, and he has a circusy background himself. So he was helping the stunt department on Hook. He saw me on set one day, dressed up as a pirate. He said, Doug, what, what are you doing? Are you, do, are you an extra? And I was like, so embarrassed. I was like, yes, I know, I know. you. you I, I, I thought I was past it, but I'm not. But it's fine, it's fine. He said, oh, but hey, I got an idea. So he uh, he actually said, come to my house uh, on Saturday. We'll, we'll videotape you doing a little stunt fight scene. Because he knew that I was a contortionist. I can put my legs behind my head. And he wanted to shoot something funny with that. So we did. And, uh, and he showed that to the stunt coordinator of Hook, who then showed it to Steven Spielberg. And they gave me a little, a little sight gag with my legs twisted around my neck for one day on, on Hook, which gave me a little upgrade for the day and gave me some dignity and, and a little bit of like, oh, you know, that was very, very sweet. Well, that, that reestablished my relationship with stuntman Bob Yerkes. I'd known him from before from an organization we belonged to, but hadn't seen him in a long time. So that was like our reconnection. So that reconnection happened at just the right time because simultaneously over at Warner Brothers, they were in development with Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. So I get this random phone call one day. I, I was on hook every day of the week for that whole summer. I was off on a Thursday. They didn't need me to come in one Thursday. I got a phone call that morning from the stunt department at Warner Brothers, uh, 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 the stunt coordinator of Batman Returns, saying, hey, uh, we got your name from Bob Yerkes. Can you come in and meet us today? I happened to be free that one day. Yes. Nice. Went to Warner Brothers, met with him, 
and he's like, yeah, we're doing, it's a circus theme to the movie, uh, Penguin is going to be hanging out with this Red Triangle Circus gang, and we're casting some, you know, acts. Uh, Bob Yerkes told us you were a contortionist, so show us what you do. So I just started like, okay, well, I started twisting arms and legs in places they shouldn't go, and, and he was like, wow, that's... Well, that's great. So he said, wait right here. I'm going to go get somebody and uh, hang on. He leaves the room. He comes back in with Tim freaking Burton. Nice. Right? So I, I, I wet myself. And, and he said, so Doug, this is Tim, our director. And uh, if you just show him what you just showed me. So yada, yada, yada. Da, 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 da. I did the leg twisty, head to be, arm twisty thing again. And he's, uh, so Tim's like, wow, that's, that's interesting. Hang right here. We're going to go in the next room and talk about you. So the two of them leave me in my, this room by myself. The longest two minutes of my life. Uh, right. And they come back in and Tim Burton says, well, great. You got the part. And I said, the part. I thought I was there for like a, you know, a little sight gag, mm-hmm. something, something mm-hmm. on one day. Turns out there was a seven week supporting character, a, a contract for seven weeks mm-hmm. as the thin clown to part of the Red Triangle Circus King. Had dialogue and everything. Because in the original script, I had a page of dialogue, a scene with Michelle Pfeiffer, and uh, it was ended up being rewritten out because mm-hmm. uh, they had to really streamline things. It was it was a very full script that went way longer than, than right. the two hours would have allowed. So I was just like shocked. All of a sudden, I thought I was coming in to do a sight gag. Now I've got a seven week contract as a supporting player next to Danny DeVito, and it was like, oh my gosh. And that seven weeks turned into 14 weeks because Tim liked me and had me hang around for longer. It was very, very, very sweet in, in the end. And uh, getting to uh, work with Michael Keaton and all of his stunt doubles, of course. The, the one scene that I had next to Michael uh, was when we, we were trashing downtown Gotham City. Right. And he comes in to wreak some havoc. You know, we've got the poodle lady, we got the knife thrower mm-hmm. game, we got the snake lady, all these people throwing bricks through windows mm-hmm. and making, create, creating havoc. Batman comes in to clean house. The sword swallower right, John comes, Strong. John Strong mm-hmm. comes, comes at him with a sword in his mouth. Like, ah! Mm-hmm. And I don't know why that's threatening, but he did it. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Michael Keaton had to grab the sword by the handle and yank it out of this man's throat and then take that sword and it, I came running at him next. So he took the sword, swiped off my bomb that was strapped to my chest, and then backhands me, punches me in the jaw, and I go flying off. So that was our exchange that had to happen. Mm-hmm. And Michael, bless his heart, uh, had never pulled a sword out of someone else's throat before, and it would give you the heebie-jeebies. It gave, oh, just watching it gave me, I, I got irpy. So Michael, uh, he, he's, he's like giving it a go, and, and John Strong is trying to convince him, seriously, I do this for a living, it's all the time, it, 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 it's safe, just pull it straight, don't try, to, don't try to angle it out, and I'll be safe and fine. So Michael's nervous, as, you, as he should be. He's pulling this out, and with it came like that really thick bile saliva, yep. the dripping, a big string of it that's kind of bowing out. Michael looks at it and goes, no, oh, and turns his head away, grossed out. So I, I, got, I got a good chuckle out of that. And when, uh, when that, that segment of the scene was done, they were resetting the cameras for my part where I come running up to him. So it's just he, Michael and I standing there. And quietly, we hadn't really exchanged many words, and I was, you know, I'm just a, a, a punk kid. He doesn't know me from Adam. So I said to him, uh, hey, uh, Michael, uh, I don't know if you heard there's been a script change. I was trying to be funny. Mm-hmm. He goes, oh, no, what, what, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's different? I said, well, uh, since you did such a great job pulling the sword out of the uh, uh, sword, uh, John's throat, uh, we thought that maybe you could pull this bomb out of my navel. <laughs> and, and Michael just kind of goes, ha, huh, and walked off. <laughs> oh, dear me. That's hilarious. Dear you me. can actually see in the shot the saliva. Was, uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. There, there's no way to avoid it when right. you're pulling something out of someone's right. you know, intestines or right. whatever. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Before we go any further, uh, do you remember anything about the dialogue that you had originally? Or? Well, see, there, oh, first of all, I had some. Oh, in, in that scene I just described, I had I was supposed to say something to Michael Keaton when I came up to him before he slices the bomb off mm-hmm. and punches me. Something like uh, uh, "We have all night" or like or "Welcome to the new Gotham City" or something. Right, right, I, right, I don't know right, something right. that was like villainy. Right, right. Uh, and then the other thing, there was a there was a 
something was going to be happening where I was standing with my fat clown partner, Travis McKenna. Mm-hmm. The two of us looked hilarious together. And Travis came, that's when I heard the, the phrase for the first time when he said, we make a perfect 10 together. And uh, But Michelle Pfeiffer was going to be lowered, lowering herself into the frame, unbeknownst to me, mm-hmm. wrapping her legs around my throat and, and squeezing, like her thighs were going to choke me out. That's how That was going to be my demise in the film. But in the end, uh, I live on. I just I ran away like a coward in the end uh, when the bat boat was coming down the tunnel toward right. the penguin's uh, lair, and I'm running a spotlight for him to make his big speech to his penguins, all his, all his real penguins. Uh, and so I hear the boat coming. I look down, and I'm like, oops, and I, and I slink off. Right. So I'm still alive out there somewhere. Well, it that's is, too right. bad, because that sounded like it would have been a pretty good way to that go. That would have been a great... If you're going to die, it might as well be between Michelle Pfeiffer's thighs. Exactly. <laughs> That's terrible. That really sounds terrible. Yeah, it yeah. sounds great, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, no one, no one wore a cat suit better than that lady. I'm just going to tell you. That yeah, was, she was amazing, and and really channeled that character beautifully. I thought. I love Tim Burton's take on on the Batman franchise because he had. He, he, he understands the dark, of course he understands mm-hmm. the dark, but he also understands the whimsy, mm-hmm. you know, and the and the, 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 the childlike comic booky ness you know. He really did a nice combo platter, I thought. Whimsy is a good word, yeah. because people always tend to think of him as dark, but I always mm-hmm. think, well, he's more, not so much dark, he's more fanciful. Fanciful. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the true meaning of fairy tales, I think. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. He definitely creates his own world. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of Tim, did he give you any backstory, or did he just come in and say, "Thin clown, fat clown, snake lady, <laughs> go"? But the backstory that he gave us was that this is sort of a a, a faded bunch of, of of circus people who don't want to give up the ghost. You know, they're, they're still clinging to their old glory days, but from the looks of them, their costumes are tattered and worn. Their makeup is smeared and old and aged. And Penguin has given them you know, sort of a new sense of family, a new reason to be, a new purpose, a new sense of purpose, even though we're still clinging on to our old glory days. Gotcha. Yeah. Did you guys form kind of a family bond? We did. I, uh, well, you know, when you're when you're with uh, when you're, I'm, I was a contortionist, right? When mm-hmm. we had a lot of people from that had specialties, mm-hmm. uh, and when specialty people are all brought together in the same room, there's absolutely an immediate bond because we're all freaks of nature, mm-hmm. and we all find solace in each other. There's love and and um, and uh, camaraderie and a sense of family that grows immediately. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Vincent uh, Schiavelli, uh, he and I actually bonded over the tall skinny thing. Oh, as that's the monkey nice. grinder. How in the world did they explain you guys getting your hands on the Batmobile blueprints? Was that something that we no. missed? I didn't write the movie. I, know. <laughs> I, just, I just wonder if maybe there's a deleted scene or something. Yeah, no, I, like not it. that I know of. Okay. Uh, and, and at the time, you know, and, and that being that being my first big feature mm-hmm. uh, that I was a part of, I read the script in mm-hmm. its entirety, but. I was I don't have I didn't have the brain for for understanding storylines and where I fit into them back then that I do now. Right. Um, I would have a much more of a keen sense of that now if I was reading it again. Mm-hmm. But back then I was just like I can't wait. I I wanted to make sure I knew my parts. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, so uh, yeah, the blueprints on the Batmobile. I, that's a good. But I had a great fun rewiring the uh, helping the uh, taking the lead in that scene with right. the, the homing device yeah. I got to plant in the engine and yeah. uh, and all. That was uh, that was a great moment. Made made for a nice still shot that, that showed up in magazines yeah. everywhere. Uh, having that on my resume and being able to, s- while before Batman Returns came out in theaters, I then had a, an audition for Hocus Pocus, mm-hmm. and being able to tell them on my you know, hey, what do you have going on? And I said, well, I just finished Batman Returns. Uh, it was like it made the room go quiet, right? Because that was a very exciting, uh, a very exciting franchise to be a part of and you know comic book movies were still young back then mm-hmm. uh, we had our Superman with mm-hmm. Christopher Reeve and you know and the first Batman mm-hmm. and, and so I remember uh, going to work the first night on Batman Returns I had the radio on in the car and the drive time news we made the news Today marks the the, uh, the commencement of principal photography on Batman Returns. You, you know, Warner Brothers. They're bad, they're bad. So, how many movies start every day in L.A. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not newsworthy, mm-hmm. but the fact that it was made me think, oh my gosh, I'm part of something big here. And of course, when the movie came out in theaters, it was at that time it was the highest-grossing opening weekend of all time. 
So I uh, I was very proud to be a, a, my, my small sliver of a part in that. I really was. It was yeah. a fun ride to be on. It's funny because everybody that I've talked to about their pieces in the Batman legacy, mm -hmm. be it a writer, be it a stuntman, mm -hmm. be it a vehicle designer, be it an actor, they're always it's always a positive thing. They're always like, I feel so lucky mm -hmm. to have been mm -hmm. part of that universe, you know? Well, totally. Well, it, it, feed, it feeds the little boy comic book reader in all of us mm -hmm. to be a part of, of something like that, to be able to you know, live and breathe on film in a in a in the world that you, you thought was all fantasy before. Now it's real. You know, right. it's great. Did you read a lot of Batman comic books when you were a kid? I, I actually read more Superman and Ar the Archies. I was a big Archies fan. Oh, funny. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, but I was a preteen, and, and I thought that the, the teenagers were really cool. So I wanted I wanted to be like I wanted to have my own rock band like Archie did. <laughs> It's great that you've ended up where you are now because I can think of very few people who seem like they're doing exactly what they're meant to be doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're very kind. Thank you. Yeah. There are others who do what I do. You know, that's why we're here at Monster Blues, actually, right. to screen the movie Men in Suits, a mm -hmm. documentary with a lot of people that like me that are in, being interviewed in it. Uh, but there's not a flock of, of young actors across America coming to L.A. to be an actor in creature suits and makeups. Right. Sure. Right. It's more like I want to be on, you know, the, the next CW show as a young hottie with great abs. Right. That's what they're all after. Right. Uh, but uh, but when you find that that small select group of people that love creepy crawly things mm -hmm. and uh, love the fantasy world, love the sci-fi genre and all that, uh, that's a that's a special select group. And uh, and I've been very very privileged and blessed to continue working in that in that genre. And the fans. The fans of, of the fantasy, sci-fi, comic book, horror genres are the most devoted, loyal fans of any entertainment out there. They really are. Uh, the conventions out there in the convention circuit, all, all the comic cons and the horror cons and the sci-fi cons, uh, prove it. Yeah. These people uh, turn out in droves to meet the people they've been watching on TV and film. And uh, those are the people that bought my house for me. So I, I love I love the fans of this genre with all my heart because yeah. uh, without them I don't have a career. Right. I talked to Adrian Barbeau too about yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, being Catwoman on the animated series. Right. And I mentioned the horror fans to her too and said, yeah, they're just the greatest. Yeah. Yeah. They'll I mean, never leave you. No. And I love you for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again. I think it's cool how you just sort of organically developed into your own little space in Hollywood, you know. Yeah, and you. I'm glad that you're such a nice guy. I mean, thank you for being nice and well, taking the time thank to... Thank you. If there's any plug time, yeah. of course, uh, my next things up are uh, season four of Falling Skies. My character continues as Cochise the alien. He Excellent. talks an awful lot. Nice. <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, I just finished Crimson Peak with Guillermo del Toro. Yes, another uh, Guillermo del Toro. My fifth Guillermo del Toro film. Yeah. Uh, I, it's Crimson Peak is a haunted house story set in the Victorian era, starring Tom Hiddleston, Charlie Hunnam, Jessica Chastain, and Mia Wasachowski-Wasachowski. <laughs> I, I, I cannot say that girl's last name. Alice from Alice in Wonderland. Right. That comes out in the fall of 2015. Wow, that uh, sounds good. And I also, I also did a Slenderman-inspired movie called um, The Operator, which uh, I play the operator in. Which, nice. uh, so that's coming sometime soon as well. And uh, much more on the horizon. Lots more on the horizon indeed. I also want to mention Doug's book, Mime Very Own Book. That's M-I-M-E, Very Own Book. It's a collection of Doug in various photographic mime-related parodies, if you can wrap your mind around that. It's uh, impossible to describe, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, some of the parodies are Mime Hamid Ali, Mime Lama Ding Dong, and of course, my personal favorite, Mime Again. There's a link to pick up a copy of the book on batpodcast.com. I highly recommend it. It is a lot of fun. And make sure you follow Doug on Facebook and Twitter at actor Doug Jones. And of course, Doug's own personal website is the Doug Jones Experience. Dot com, And you can keep an eye out for upcoming conventions that he's going to be appearing at. And it is indeed an experience meeting Doug, one I'm happy to have had and hope to have again. 
He's in your town. Buy a ticket. Go meet him. He is a fantastic guy. And as they say, it's not a convention unless you get a hug from Doug. And that is so true. He is a very huggy guy, a true sweetheart, and I cannot wait to see him again. So thanks again to Doug, and thanks to you for listening. I hope you had a great time. I did. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at PatTheBatmanFan and on Facebook at the Bat Podcast. And there's links, of course, to those on BatPodcast.com as well. Don't forget my interview with Adrian Barbeau, a.k.a. Selena Kyle, a.k.a. Catwoman from the animated series is coming up soon. It also features my buddy Larry from Blast from the Past in Burbank as well. And we've got some amazing guests coming up. I hope you stay tuned. I'm Pat the Batman fan. I'll see you next time live from Gotham City.